Welcome to the fourth in the 2021 Lenten Meditation Series with the community of St. Andrew's Church here in Toronto. Our theme this year is God So Loved the World, and it continues the same theme from 2020 when our series was cut short by the restrictions imposed by the COVID-19 pandemic. We've learned a great deal since then about online presence and possibilities. And so we come to you this year in this YouTube format, and we invite you into Zoom conversations on each Thursday in Lent. We welcome as our speakers staff from the Life and Mission Agency of the Presbyterian Church in Canada, who each week will tell us a bit about their work and their perspective on how God's love is manifested in the world. In these difficult times, it is sometimes hard to recognize God's presence and God's love in the world. Yet in the ongoing work of those on staff in the Presbyterian Church's national office, we can see signs of hope and possibility even in the midst of change and challenge. Today we welcome the Reverend Glynis Williams, who is the Associate Secretary for International Ministries of the Presbyterian Church. Before working at the national office, Glynis was the director of Action Refugié in Montreal. Glynis will be joined today by Lily Coe, who is the program coordinator in International Ministries, who will be reading scripture. Each week, our meditations will begin with a version of J.S. Bach's Passion Chorale, played on by our director of music, Dan Bickel, on St. Andrew's magnificent Carl Wilhelm Tracker organ. We trust that you will find these meditations meaningful and inspiring in these Lenten days.
Let us join together in prayer. Let us pray. God of all the world, you call us to see and hear and understand, to open our eyes and ears and hearts, to be aware. Forgive our false pride and complacency and our unthinking consumption. Lord, have mercy upon us. Forgive us for our insularity, for our reluctance to accept new ways. Lord, have mercy upon us. Forgive us for our complaining, for growing bitter and sorry for ourselves, for becoming hardened and indifferent to the pain of others. Lord, have mercy upon us. God, make us aware, make us repentant. We turn to you. Heal us of our privileged blindness and make us whole, we pray. Amen. Today's reading is from John chapter 8, verses 12 to 20. Once again, Jesus spoke to the people. This time he said, I am the light for the world. Follow me, and you won't be walking in the dark. You will have a light that gives life. The Pharisees objected. You are the only one speaking for yourself, and what you say isn't true. Jesus replied, Even if I do speak for myself, what I say is true. I know where I came from and where I am going. But you don't know where I am from or where I am going. You judge in the same way that everyone else does, but I don't judge anyone. If I did judge, I would judge fairly, because I would not be doing it alone. The Father who sent me is here with me. Your law requires two witnesses to prove that something is true. I am one of my witnesses, and the Father who sent me is the other one. Where is your father? they asked. You don't know me or my father, Jesus answered. If you knew me, you would know my father. Jesus said this while he was still teaching in the place where the temple treasures were stored, but no one arrested him because his time had not yet come. This is the word of the Lord. For many years, I attended the 6 a.m. Ash Wednesday service at the Anglican Cathedral in Montreal. I went with a friend. There were barely half a dozen of us attending this first service of the day. As a lifelong Presbyterian, the early morning ritual of prayers, a short sermon, and the imposition of ashes had not been a regular part of my routine for the beginning of Lent. Standing before the priest, I heard these quiet words directed at each person. Remember you are dust, and to dust you shall return. These familiar words remind us of the fragility of life, something that has become painfully evident during this time of pandemic. We are a small part of the thread of life. It seemed a bit strange that this solemn rite of being marked by ashes in the sign of the cross was followed by going for breakfast. I was always a little uncertain whether to remove the faint sign of the ashes on my forehead or not. Was it pride to show this visible religious tradition or merely a sign of faith during the most meaningful season of the church year. I confess that I am not an early morning person, so getting up before 5 a.m. was motivated by a strong desire to start Lent with worship in the tiny gathered community, a tradition that held until I moved away from Montreal. Historically, our reform tradition objects to Lent because of the emphasis on penitential practices. How can it be that giving up a cup of coffee or chocolate for Lent is an act of holiness? It might make us cranky or sleepy rather than holy. Performing an act of penance was understood as doing good works that would earn us God's favor. But of course, the love of God is freely given it is not earned. Lent is about Jesus 
and how we engage in following Christ in our communities and in the larger world. Lent is six weeks, but the call of Jesus is all year long. One theologian has summed up our role as followers of Jesus saying that it is believing, doing, and being. During these few weeks of Lent, we can ponder what we do believe in and how we live it in actions, in prayer, and our presence in the world. How we live and express our faith in Jesus Christ is all that is expected. The passage in the Gospel of John that was read is austere. There is no story or event mentioned. Jesus is having a tough discussion with the Pharisees who are annoyed at him and dispute his comments. Jesus says to them, I am the light of the world, and whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light that gives life. How does the season of Lent serve us during this time of pandemic? A clue to answering this question lies with the words of Jesus saying, I am the light of the world. And if you follow me, you will have that light that gives life. During this pandemic year, many of us have experienced different reactions, anxiety, loneliness, impatience, and fear. Walking has been helpful for many of us, physically and spiritually. Many prayers have been offered while we walked. The constant flow of information, not always consistent, has been reassuring at times, but at other times, frightening. As we enter our second year of Lent under COVID-19, the stories of families denied final hugs and lonely deaths echo the death of Jesus. The one who knew sorrow, pain and loneliness says that if we follow him, we will have the light that gives life. Perspective is one of the hardest things to attain in life. We draw conclusions from what we have seen and experienced personally. Lifting our horizon to see and hear the reality elsewhere is God's gift to us. Our vision expands and our obsessions take a back seat. Working with refugees in the past and now with global partners in more than 20 countries has provided some perspective for me and my colleagues. Because International Ministries engages with global partners, we have heard stories of tragedy, resilience, and courage during this time. We have also been gently reminded by partners to recognize the things that separate us because of our relative privilege and resources. Let me share some stories from our partners. Vivian Bertrand was appointed by International Ministries of the Presbyterian Church to work almost three years in Malawi in Southern Africa. She worked with an organization called CARD, Churches Action in Relief and Development. Some of Vivian's work involved helping Malawians recover after they lost their crops and homes to Cyclone Idai in March 2019. Working with colleagues from the Mennonite Central Committee, Vivian visited villages after the cyclone and met people who had lost everything. One interview was with a 12-year-old girl who was now the head of the household. Her mother was dead and her father had abandoned them. She was now responsible for her three younger siblings. The cyclone had washed away all the crops just prior to the harvest time. Their wooden house had collapsed with the rains and their meager belongings were swept away in the flooding. How does a child express what is in her heart and mind given this tragedy? Vivian was on a return visit to this remote Southern area when the team distributed bags of maize. This would keep these families alive, at least for a while. 
Amidst the many women and some men waiting for the delivery, Vivian saw the girl. Vivian's grasp of the Chichewa language is limited and she was unable to ask for permission to hug her, but she hoped it did not make her uncomfortable. It was the only thing Vivian had to offer, love. Vivian embraced her, keeping silence until the girl walked away all alone. Vivian was present there with her. Empathy met grief. Our role as followers of Jesus is believing, doing, and being. God was present as comfort was offered to this child with a hug. Vivian being there with her, even briefly, expressed love. In reflecting on her experience of living in Malawi, Vivian recently wrote, and I quote, living and working in someone else's country is a powerful way to show that they are important to us. It shows that we haven't forgotten that they are a brother or sister in Christ. It also teaches us much about our faith, culture, worldview, and priorities. After living in the warm heart of Africa, as Malawi is accurately known, one of Vivian's greatest fears is that Canadians will be afraid to live courageously and with compassion when this pandemic is over. Back in Canada, Vivian saw how easy it is to focus only on our country or our fears while forgetting the struggles of those living in other parts of the world. She hopes that when COVID restrictions are lifted, we will be less fearful and more grateful for what we have, that we fear economic instability less and therefore tithe more intentionally. She hopes that international ministries will continue to send mission staff to be the living links with global partners when it is possible. People and relationships matter. There is a little piece of heaven in the hills of Nepal on the compound of the Tenzin Mission Hospital. Dr. Nick and Becky Bauman, together with four children, spent two years in Tenzin. Nick worked as a, a surgeon, as well as mentoring interns and students. Becky gave birth in Tenzin to her fourth child, Dorothy, called Dot. A baby did not prevent Becky from getting involved as children are beloved in Nepal and Dot soon had several mums. The Christian community is small in Nepal, under 2% of the population, but it is growing. The worship is joyful and enthusiastic. Becky is an occupational therapist and she soon discovered a newly established program for people who were shunned. It is not uncommon for people with mental health issues to be put out on the street or even imprisoned. A hospital administrator, a member of the church, whose name is Poon, had a vision of a place in the countryside where residents could live. The name tells the story. The New Life Psychiatric Rehabilitation Center is giving new life to the most marginalized. The focus of this place is to show God's love to the people who have been cast aside, to touch and care for people with mental illness so that the larger community can see that they are not to be feared. From her home in Aurelia, Becky remains committed to this program and the people. She returned to Tanzan in January, 2020 to attend a prayer dedication ceremony for the center. Becky now acts as a liaison person for international ministries between the New Life Center and the Presbyterian Church. She is a living link for us, opening the window into a very different world that God loves. Moving now to the Middle East, the story is from Lebanon. On the 4th of August, 2020, a deadly explosion occurred in Beirut, killing 204 people 
and causing 7,500 casualties. Lebanon is unique in the Middle East. It is cosmopolitan with friendly people and excellent universities. An important partner for the Presbyterian Church in Canada is the Near East School of Theology known as NEST. It's located in the heart of Beirut. NEST is an eight story concrete building with three stories underground. Students and professors live in the building. Every window and every door was shattered by the powerful blast. Dr. George Sabra is the president, or we would say the principal of NEST. This small seminary offers programs in Christian education and masters of theology degrees, and it trains 90% of the Protestant pastors in all of the Middle East countries. Prior to the blast, Lebanon was already dealing with the devaluation of the Lebanese currency and the worry that fewer international students would study at NEST due to COVID restrictions and fear. Our connection with NEST goes back to 1988 when the Reverend Dr. Ted and Betty Severns, Canadian Presbyterians served there during the war years. Ted was not allowed off the NEST compound for fear of kidnapping for ransom. Having visited NEST, it was inspiring to witness their commitment to excellence in teaching and in scholarship. NEST attracts talented young women and men for leadership in their churches. The language of instruction is English and students were eager to share their experiences and hopes for the future. Christians may be a tiny minority in the region, but their enthusiasm is rooted in their faith. Even before the blast, it was a difficult time for Nest, but they had hope for the future. Dr. Sabra quoted the prophet Jeremiah who was in prison when his land was threatened with destruction by a foreign army. Yet Jeremiah had faith and invested in his homeland by buying his cousin's land. Investing in the future of Nest while Lebanon is in chaos and the Christian population is small is an audacious act of faith in the future. It is not folly, but faith. Faith in the living God in the very region where Jesus was born and taught. Our world is increasingly polarized and insular, but NEST stands out as it plays a key ecumenical and interreligious role. This includes engagement between Sunni and Shia clerics, for which Dr. Sabra is well known and respected. It is hard to express in words the compelling energy that is present among the students and professors as well as the African and European students who have studied at NEST prior to COVID. With so much to lament these days, this small seminary is a beacon of hope in a turbulent religious landscape. Last spring, International Ministries launched a financial appeal for NEST, which was matched by a special fund. When we sent the grant, Dr. Sabra wrote, and I quote, we are overwhelmed by the support and solidarity that our friends and partners have shown. The Presbyterian Church is foremost among them. I cannot adequately express our gratitude and appreciation." End quote. The reality is that we need each other. The richness of our shared faith in Jesus Christ is enhanced when we learn support, worship, and pray for each other. As followers of Jesus, we are called to faithfully engage in God's mission. Let us join with global partners that witness to the God of love, justice, and compassion in their diverse contexts. Jesus said, I am the light of the world, and if you follow me, you will have that light that gives life. Go forth in the light of God. Amen. We thank Glynis and Lily for their participation in the service today. 
We are grateful to hear more about the work of International Ministries after sharing with Blair Bertrand and Tekozi Chitsulo from Malawi two weeks ago. Your snapshots of the ministry of God's people in different parts of the world has helped us to enlarge our vision and understanding of the work of the Church and the work of the Spirit among us. Thank you for the work you do each day and for being our connection with sisters and brothers, siblings in Christ around the world. If you would like to join a conversation with Glynis, please be in touch with me by email at b.ferris at standrewstoronto.org and I will send you the information for the Zoom meeting on Thursday. We look forward to having you with us. And please join us next week for the final Lenten meditation when our speaker will be Kara Earhart, the coordinator for the Sexuality and Inclusion Program of the Life and Mission Agency. Kara will be joined by the Reverend Anita Van Nest, the pastor of Stamford Presbyterian Church in Niagara Falls, who is a member of the Gender, Sexuality, Orientation and Faith Advisory Committee. Let us close our time together with prayer. Let us pray. Teach us to pray, O Christ, that your reign will come, that your will be done, that earth will become like heaven for the hurt and the hurting, the wounded and warring, the hated and hating. Teach us to pray, O Christ, for the power is yours. And now bless, O Spirit, the ways we choose this day. Bless, O Spirit, the words we say. Bless, O Spirit, the forgiveness we give, the bread we share, the prayers we pray, that we may become your blessing for one another. Amen.